Hey guys, welcome to another episode of DIY Guitar Making at Eric Schaefer Guitars. I'm Eric Schaefer, and today I'm going to talk to you about 14 different mistakes that I see people doing when they're building their first acoustic guitar. So this video topic has kind of been stewing in the back of my mind for a while. As many of you guys know, I teach an online guitar building course and as of the time of this video, there's 73 people in that course, so I get a lot of questions and comments through the members forum. Also, I get a lot of questions and comments through various social media and some email questions as well. And then there's also the students in the live workshops that I do, the eight-day workshops here in Burnville, Pennsylvania. Um, but those students are kind of cushioned from a lot of the mistakes that I'm going to talk about because they come into my shop and they get to use my tools and um, the materials that I've prepared for them. So a lot of the mistakes I'm talking about are really more geared towards the first time builder who's doing it DIY style at home. So the first mistake I see, and this one's pretty common, is people wanting to use either opportunistic woods or reclaimed woods. Um, and when I say opportunistic woods, I'm defining that as woods that say uh, my neighbor Jim has a stockpile of walnut that he cut down from his backyard and he's had it sitting out for a year and uh, he says it's well seasoned, he uses it for firewood so you know it must be dry enough. Woods like that, that's a wood of opportunity where you're just trying to either save a buck or you're trying to follow some sort of purist sensibility or ideology of building, which is to say that you want to build an instrument from the rawest, rawest materials that you yourself can gather. And I get that, and I, I get even the saving money part of it, I get the, the reason why it's an attractive thought. Um, I've had a, a lot of people ask me if they can use pine for bracewood and for guitar tops, like just eastern white pine. It's never to say that you can't do something like that, but you are absolutely fighting an uphill battle as a beginner. Even as an, like, if I were to work on a, a pine top, I would butcher the thing. You're talking about a wood that has very widely spaced grain lines. It's not like spruce um, or cedar at all, even though it's a soft wood. Something like a pine um, is going to have very broadly spaced grain, grain lines, and imagine the thickness or the width of the braces that are inside of a guitar. Now you're trying to carve a brace that has, say, one grain line across its width, whereas if it was just a piece of spruce or something that is actually suited to guitar building, it might have uh, eight or nine grain lines across the thickness of that, uh, let's say it's a, one of the X-Brace arms. Tighter the grain lines, the easier it's going to be to carve that wood. Um, and if you just have one or two grain lines, it's not going to really carve, it's going to just tear out in big ugly chunks. Now on top of that, pine is also a very resinous wood. Um, it's not a very stable wood. It doesn't have a good uh, strength to weight ratio. There's just a lot of reasons why opportunistic woods like that, even a, a legit wood like legit, like walnut that you got from your neighbor, well, there's problems there too. Black walnut's an excellent guitar building wood, but the fact that you got it from your neighbor Jim tells me that there's a good chance that the wood isn't really dry or stable yet. When you order wood from a supplier, particularly a luthier supplier, you're getting wood that is usually kiln dried, kiln dried. Dealing with wood that isn't quite seasoned or even just trying to figure out if it is going to be stable in your shop atmosphere is just a whole nother can of worms that um, being a first time guitar builder, you're not gonna wanna deal with, trust me. And so what about reclaimed woods? Now with reclaimed woods, you kind of have a lot of the same problems except um, you know that the wood is, is probably going to be really old, and so old, old wood like that, 
that's been around in somebody's attic or something like that for years and years and years, say it's attic flooring, that's going to be a lot more stable just because it's of its age. But still, you're running into all kinds of problems with reclaimed wood. One, it's certainly not going to be luthier grade wood. Wood that is used for attic flooring is not going to be very quarter sawn. It's, in a lot of cases, it's going to even be flat sawn. And being a first time guitar builder, you probably don't want to have to deal with trying to pick through these boards. Building with opportunistic woods or reclaimed woods really is not a way to learn because it's going to be such a frustrating process and you're going to have to deal with things that regular guitar builders who use guitar woods from um, suppliers don't have to deal with. And now this brings me right into the second mistake and that is on the other extreme end of what people do when they're sourcing wood for their first guitar and that's buying super expensive wood um, Brazilian rosewood or just uh, grade quadruple A uh, Coca Bolo or something like that. Something really nice. You're treating yourself. I get it. This being your first guitar, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. You might not even realize how many mistakes you're going to make. And if you plan on building more guitars after that, you really should be saving those really expensive wood choices for the guitars that are going to really showcase both your craftsmanship and the stunning beauty of that wood. Because your first guitar, no matter how um, patient and no matter how much you work as a perfectionist and very slowly and calculated, you're going to make some noticeable mistakes on it. It doesn't matter how good that wood looks, if the, the joinery looks a little gappy, or your, your binding has gaps, or something like that, it's really going to uh, take away from the beauty of that wood. So you might as well use something more in the middle. Moderation is really what I'm talking about here. So let's avoid those two extremes. We want to avoid the absolute cheapest, the free wood that Neighbor Jim has and we want to also avoid the Brazilian rosewood and the super expensive stuff. Um, to give a concrete recommendation here, I would say woods like Sapelli, not the highest grade either, but not the lowest grade, not second grade and not quadruple A grade. Um, double A grade Sapelli, maybe triple A grade Sapelli, within that range, th those are great choices. You're gonna get some fantastic, not only great looking wood, great sounding wood, um, but something like Sapelli really carves well. It's easy to work with, just like, similarly to mahogany. Uh, another great wood would be cherry. Cherry is uh, pretty easy to work with as well, and it's also a, it's a domestic wood, at least to North America, and it's a, cheaper wood. So now the third mistake that I see people making also has to do with choosing your wood. Um, but this is the last one on the wood choice topic, don't worry, and then we'll get into other stuff. And that mistake that I see is people want to use highly figured wood and they don't realize what um, skills need to accompany using that sort of wood. When you carve that wood, it's going to behave somewhat unpredictably because of that wandering grain and even worse when you bend the wood if you're hand bending it or you're using a, a side bender like I have right here either way those highly figured woods are the most difficult woods to bend there's a very 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 high chance on your first bend that you're going to break that highly figured set and um, usually those highly figured woods are pretty expensive too, so I think you'd be much happier bending a cheaper set of cherry or sapelli. Again, those, are, those two woods bend really easily, as well as are, are easy to, to carve and to work. 
So anyway, avoid the figured woods just because they're hard to work and they come with their own set of problems, not even because they're usually expensive. So even if you find a cheap set of curly maple sides, just don't use them on your first bending project. The next thing I see people doing is they bite off more than they can chew. Basically, they want to do everything themselves, which I get, I understand that. Again, it's that purist uh, ideology. You want to say that you built this yourself. I mean, other people aren't going to, you know, think you're less of a builder if you don't, you know, resaw your own tops and backs or even join them and think, or you don't bend your sides. Um, in fact, bending, not bending the sides is probably the best thing you can do as a first time builder, because that is one of the most problematic areas. That, that is one of the areas where I get the most um, questions and comments where people uh, write something in the forum or I get an email or something like that and they say, hey, I, I cracked the set. What do I do now? It happens all the time. And what I really recommend for someone building their first guitar is to cut operations like that out of it. And what you can do is you can introduce side bending to your second guitar, your third guitar, or something like that. But your first guitar, is it's not a bad idea even to just use kit parts. Most of the parts are, are pretty much prefabricated for you and you're just kind of assembling it. There's no shame in starting out building a guitar like that. And then, I mean, that's what I did. The first guitar I built was with Dale Unger. It was an archtop guitar in Nazareth, PA. And then after that, my second guitar, I built a kit guitar. And after that, I um, didn't build a kit guitar. I ordered parts, I think, from LMI, but a lot of those parts I had serviced. I think I had the sides pre-bent for me. So that way I didn't have to worry about that part of it. And then it was a process of every iteration of a new guitar build, I would introduce a new process. So I would order the sides unbent the next time and then bend them myself. For my skill level at that time, that was the best thing for me to do because I wasn't getting frustrated, I wasn't getting really hung up at these early steps. Okay, and the next thing is buying tools in bulk. Don't do it, don't do it. Do not do this. Do not buy your tools in bulk ahead of time. Buy them as you build, as you need them. That way you're only going to buy the tools that you need. If you buy a whole bunch of tools up front, thinking, oh, I'm gonna need this, this, and this. When I get to the fretboard radiusing, I'm gonna need this. Um, and then I'm gonna need this for the finishing stage. You're going to end up researching different things and changing your mind so many times that you'll end up with just a thousand dollars of tools that you you're just never going to use because you you bought everything up front rather than focusing on that one step that you're at at that moment buying the tools you need for just that step and then worrying about what's next i know uh Stu mac for example has these like package deals where you know you buy like the the fret tool set and it's like you get a fretting hammer and nippers and a couple other different things. When I was first starting out I, I got a, a couple of those. I think I got that one, the, the fretting set. And it's a deal where you literally save I think two dollars or something like that. So you save almost nothing and what you what I always ended up with when I did that was uh, maybe two or three tools that I was actually looking for and that I used and then uh, another tool or, or two that were with the set that I just never used. And those tools might be like $40 a piece. So whereas on the whole set I saved you know, $2 um, off of buying all those tools individually, I actually spent a lot more because I have those two $40 tools that I don't use at all. So don't buy tools in bulk. But if you are going to buy tools sort of in bulk, or you know at least buy them opportunistically, then I would recommend going to flea markets and um, sometimes at uh, 
you know, yard sales or even like estate sales or something like that, you can end up, you know, loading up on a lot of tools for super cheap that you think you might need, you might not, just kind of good to have tools. That I think is a good idea because honestly in those cases, especially at flea markets, you can get them so cheap that um, it really doesn't matter if you don't use them. And then also keep in mind that a lot of the larger stationary equipment like thickness sanders and even bandsaws and stuff like that, um, you don't even need to buy, and you probably shouldn't for your first guitar build. Look up a maker space in your area, wherever you live, there's, there's a good chance if you're near a major metropolitan area that there will be a maker space or a wood shop of some kind, and you can just rent time on their equipment. Even if you intend on getting, say, a thickness sander at some point in the future, it's still a good idea to do that so you can get an idea of what type of thickness sander or planer or bandsaw you actually need for your purposes. Because those are expensive items and items that probably should last you a really long time, so it's something that you really want to um, make a good purchase decision on. Okay, another mistake first-time guitar builders make is skipping the dry run. What is a dry run? A dry run is when you assemble um, the parts that you intend to glue together, but without glue, hence dry, and that way you just check that um, your mating surfaces are conforming nicely and that uh, all your clamps fit and everything like that. Basically, you're just making sure that nothing's going to go wrong when you do have glue in place. And it's one thing to skip the dry run when you know you're on your fifth guitar and you've done the same exact step a whole bunch of times, you know your setup is good, um, and you kind of know how everything's going to uh, pan out as you go through that assembly process. I would still, you know, in most cases recommend you still do a dry run, but definitely when it's your first time doing a, an operation, you don't want to just spread glue on there and you know, figure it out as you go. If only for the reason that when you don't do a dry run, let's say I'm trying to glue something onto here, you see all this extra space here on this C-clamp? I now have to sit here with the glue curing, turning it like this, when if I had just done the dry run to begin with, this would already, come on, this would already have been right where I needed it to be. If I was prepared, this would have been in the perfect position to just turn that screw a couple times and have it locked down. That way, um, the assembly goes smoothly and quickly so the glue doesn't tack up early, and also um, I don't end up having to, I don't end up finding out that certain clamps just won't fit in there, and then having to um, jury rig something together to make it work kinda sort of on the fly. That's how you end up with um, very sloppy joinery and uh, fretboards and things like that that just completely slide off their marks. And the next thing is using dull edge tools. An edge tool is anything um, like a chisel or a hand plane, spoke shave, anything that uses an edge to shear wood. And if that edge isn't sharp, it's worthless. I mean, it really is. You, um, you need to learn, if you're going to use edge tools at all, you need to learn to sharpen them. Now, I think a lot of people get turned off by um, learning how to sharpen hand tools because they think that, they, they see you know, a lot of videos online and things like that about how to get these tools scary sharp and how to do it with um, stones. And first of all, using stones, sharpening by hand is a lot more difficult than just using something like like the WorkSharp sharpening system. So this is a, you know, it's a power tool. I plug it in and this disc spins around and I can flatten the back and then sharpen the bevel in there. And I actually love this thing. Um, it's called the WorkSharp 3000. There's also, I, I've never used this, but uh, it's, I think it would be an upgrade to this. I've, thought, I've considered buying it, so it's even more expensive than this. It's uh, the Robert Sorby something or other. I don't know. Look up Robert Sorby with sharpening. 
and you'll you'll see his system. Um, that looked really sophisticated as well, but something like the WorkSharp 3000 really takes the learning curve off of sharpening, which I know can be an extremely intimidating process for beginners. Um, but certainly, if you're not going to learn how to sharpen at all, just don't use hand tools, honestly. Try and you know, get by with router bits and, and things like that. Try and use power tools, because if you're gonna be using dull planes and chisels, um, you might as well just not be using them. It's unsafe, it you know, butchers your work, and you're better off just using sandpaper at that point, or files, some sort of abrasive tool. Just don't use edge tools if you're not gonna learn how to sharpen them. And I'm not saying that to put down people who don't know how to sharpen edge tools, I'm just saying that they're not worth using if they're not, if they're not workable sharp. Again, they don't have to be scary sharp, they don't have to be you know, woodworking competition sharp where you're trying to, you know, shave your entire arm with a chisel. They just have to be workably sharp. And by the way, when you buy new tools, new chisels, um, new plane ba blades, mostly the chisel stuff, when you buy them from the store, they are not sharp. They don't sharpen them before they send them out. And for good reason too, because they're just going to get dull in the pr through the process of shipping them and everything like that. They expect someone buying a high-end, say, a Lee Nielsen chisel, they expect that person to sharpen it themselves when they take that tool home. Okay, so in the last one I mentioned routers, and actually the next mistake that I see people making is they use routers inappropriately. I know a lot of people will say that the table saw is the most dangerous tool in the shop, and, you know, arguably they could be right, but I think the most dangerous tool in the shop is the router. There are so many different configurations for a router. You could have it in a router table. Um, it could be a handheld router. It could be a plunge router. It could be a laminate trim router. Um, you might have a fence on it. You might have no fence. It could be a pattern bit, a flush trim bit. There are so many different ways that you use a router and the muscle memory um, of how you used it in a previous application often doesn't help you use it in a different, the, the new application. You know, when, say, you, you're very used to using a um, handheld router and now you're using a router table where the whole thing's flipped upside down and it has a flush trim bit on it and you're trying to pattern, um, you're trying to cut a, a, a pattern out on the template. These are very different operations and they require a different skill set and thought process for using it, for using the router safely. And a lot of people assume that all router configurations are the same and really they end up hurting themselves. They, you, know, you don't want to end up like this. I'm just kidding here. See, I have my finger. But still, imagine if I didn't. You don't want that to happen to you. and. Uh, it can happen. Don't ever assume that uh, any tool, any power tool is safe. You really need to be extra cautious about how you set things up, first of all. The setup is key, and then also you just need to be aware of where your hands are while you're running a tool through any sort of router-based configuration. And on top of that, you also need to be aware of the grain direction because if you start biting into the grain, it's going to throw the workpiece, and I'm not going to totally get into that here. I've done other videos where I've talked about that a little bit. And you also want to be aware uh, of when you're cutting, say, on end grain. You want to be aware of what type of wood you're cutting, because a lot of the super dense tropical woods that we use in guitar building, like ebony and rosewood, in a lot of cases, you don't even want to touch that with a router bit. But anyway, I don't want to harp on this too much and completely scare you away from router bits, um, but I, I do want to mention that there is an alternative. In a lot of cases, like say if you're using these hard, dense woods and it's on end grain or something like that, basically it's a situation where using a router bit is not advisable. There is an alternative that I've been using a lot recently, and um, let me show you that real quick. Okay, so this is uh, called the Robo Sander, and it's really just a... 
sanding sleeve over a, a spindle that's held in the, the drill press. So I can run it on my drill press. It has a bearing on the bottom. So it works just like a pattern bit in difficult situations, either with small pieces like a bridge or a headstock where I'd have to have my hands kind of close um, or just with pieces that have a lot of curves changing grain direction or end grain I can use this and it's going to work out a lot better and, and be safer than using the router bit. Um, Stu Max sells this I haven't really seen I haven't seen these anywhere else I haven't seen them in woodworking stores which is always uh, kind of surprised me because it seems like such a simple concept and such a great alternative to the router bit in situations where the router bit might seem a little sketchy because the parts we work with are so small and the woods we work with um, a lot of them are so dense it's just a bad combination of small workpiece and dense wood so when someone shows me their first guitar that they built. One of the first things I look for is I'll feel around on the neck. There's a scoop in the middle of the neck and it shouldn't be like that. It should, the neck should taper from the nut to the heel. It should start out thin at the nut and then taper out towards the heel so it's fatter towards the heel. That's usually what people intend to do when they build their first guitar. However, they when they use edge tools like this spoke shave. It's actually a great tool for neck carving, but for a beginner, when you're using edge tools like this, a lot of beginners don't realize that while they're using this tool, that it's cutting deeper in the middle of the stroke than it is at the beginning and at the end. So you start your cut across the neck, and it's gonna dig deep at the center of the stroke, and then as you finish off that stroke and it exits the wood, it's going to come back up and out again. The end result is that you'll have this scoop in the middle that will, will be sort of imperceptible to the builder at the time, um, especially if they don't understand that aspect of using an edge tool. By the time they get the nut area of the neck and the heel area of the neck down to the dimensions that they wanted, they'll check the middle and, oh crap, they'll notice that they're lower in the middle than they are at the nut end. And the nut end is supposed to be the lowest point. So anyway, now they've got a scoop in the neck and there's no way to get that out without bringing the whole neck down even thinner. It's one of those mistakes that nobody really warns people about. You don't think about it. I did that on my first couple guitars and I still didn't catch on to it. I, I kept doing it. Anyway, there's a very simple solution to this, and it's really just not to use edge tools. It's not to say that edge tools, like the spoke shave, are bad tools for neck carving. They're actually great for it, but for the beginner, when you already have so much on your plate that you're trying to comprehend all at once, it's much easier to just not have to worry about that and just use files. Here, I'll show you a couple files that I use. So this is what I'm talking about. Um, I have this file here, which is a flea market find, and it's a really great file just because it's so long. I mean, it's like 18 or 20 inches long, which means you get great leverage on both ends. This is called the Shinto Rasp. Uh, you can find this um, I mean, you can get it on Amazon or just find it at like a woodcraft store or something like that. This thing is freaking amazing. Seriously, this is a workhorse. This removes so much material so quickly and it does a great job of keeping um, the neck nice and flat lengthwise as you're carving, which is the, you know, the struggle you have with edge tools. Abrasive tools won't dig deep in the middle. And then I have, you know, it's good to have some rat tail rasps and some uh, half round rasps like this. Another mistake I see a lot of people make is they thickness their parts right away in the beginning to their final dimensions and that is a big problem. I've done it myself when I was starting out and I learned pretty quickly not to do that. Um, you really want to leave 10 to 20 thousandths of an inch 
maybe even more, of extra thickness to your plates and to your sides. Because when you go to final sand everything to get it ready for finish, you're going to be sanding all the way down to 220 grit, in some cases 320 grit. Through that sanding process, you're going to lose so much of that thickness. And if you're already at your final thickness, and you know, as you know with guitar plates, um, when people give dimensions for the final thickness of their, their top and their back, they're very thin. These are very thin plates. They really can't afford to be thicknessed much further before it becomes a problem. Uh, and by a problem, I mean it becomes so thin that it's brittle and it, it kind of breaks apart. It, they can even become so thin that the sound starts to get kind of flabby. It's really a structural problem as well. So anyway, that's a, a big mistake, I think. You really need to leave that extra 10 to 20 thousandths of an inch or more um, so that when you sand through the grits, you'll arrive at your final thickness at the end. Another mistake I see people make is that they don't start with the end in mind, meaning they don't have a co cohesive plan or a guide for building this guitar. So what they end up doing is they just start working on the guitar and then say for example when they get to the fretboard, uh, then they're going to decide what uh, radius they're going to use and what scale length. And really you need to know from the start all of your dimensions, otherwise you're going to end up with some sort of compounding error or, a, or just conflicting dimensions further down the line. So to avoid that, just get a set of plans or take an online course. I teach an online course. Yeah, I'm plugging myself right now. It's an incredibly detailed course. It took me two years to build it. And it's tw about 25 hours of video tutorials walking you step by step from the very beginning stages of building your first acoustic guitar to the very end stages of you know, prepping it for finish and finishing and all that good stuff. Um, anyway, that's really the best way, honestly, of having a guide and a cohesive plan from start to finish so you don't end up with a mishmash of you know, conflicting ideas that seem good at the time, but because they don't all stick together and work together, it's not a great guitar. Even better, come out to Burnville, Pennsylvania and take one of my live workshops where we build a guitar here in person from start to finish and then at the end of that course when you go home to work on your second guitar every student gets the online course anyway so then when you go home it's not like you're completely off on your own you still have that you know 25 hours of online video to go through to guide you through your then second guitar at home um, another mistake that I see people make is their sides are not square to their plates. And when I say square, I'm really saying that with air quotes because your plates have a radius on them, so they're not gonna be square in the sense that they're, that this is a 90 degree edge right here. What you don't want is your, your sides to be tipped between those two plates because this is 100% what affects um, the quality of your binding channels. There's a lot of different systems out there for how to cut your binding channels. You can use those binding towers, that's what I use. Um, you can use this little thing from Stu Mac that hooks onto a Dremel tool. And honestly, any system that you use for binding is going to work, and it's going to work pretty well. There's ways to cut the, cut the binding um, by hand without power tools. All of these systems, all of these different ways of cutting your binding channels, they all rely on the sides being flat and square to these two plates. Again, square in quotation marks because we have the radius on the top and the back. But still, we don't want any sort of dramatic tip because something is going to be referencing, whether it's a bearing on a router bit or um, it's that Graw mill tool that uh, LMI sells it. It's pretty good. I like it. If you want to look that up, Graw mill. That's if you want to hand cut your your channels. But anyway, any system you use relies on referencing off of the side surface. One of the biggest mistakes, or most not biggest, one of the most common mistakes I see with someone's first guitar is 
um, either through the process of bending, they might have you know, severe cups and warps in the sides, or they just never you know, sanded everything square and level before they cut their binding channels. Either way, because this surface was not a good flat and square reference surface all the way around, their uh, binding channels end up being gappy. So then when they glue their binding in, they have all these little gaps around the binding and uh, it just doesn't look as good as it could be. It's one of those those things that as a beginner you think is not a big deal. You're not worried about you know all those little indentations and things in your sides um, because you think aesthetically you, you don't really notice them and you don't. They're, they're not a, a huge eyesore at that point. However, what you don't realize is how much that affects your binding channels, which gappy binding, that's a big eyesore. So what's the solution? The solution is, well, one, we talked about this earlier, if you're a first time builder, it's not a bad idea to have somebody else bend the sides for you. LMI does that. You can just order bent sides from LMI. And they will likely do a better job of bending than you will your first time hand bending at home. They've, you know, they've been doing this for a while, and I've, I've ordered bent sides from them in the past, and um, of course they, they, they come back. They tend to lose their bend um, just through the shipping process. You know, they, they're coming from California all the way out to here. By the time they get to me, they've unbent themselves a little bit. But overall, you know, across their width, they're not all wonky. They're, they're pretty straight up and down. So I'm already starting in a, off in a good place there. Um, furthermore, another thing you can do is, and should do, when you get to the point where you're ready to cut your binding channels, make sure you sand these surfaces nice and flat. Get rid of all those little those small indentations. Really deep indentations, um, you know, areas where it warped from bending, you might not be able to sand all the way through, and um, I'm not going to really get into that too much. And as a first time builder, you're probably just going to have to live with a gappy channel in that spot. Okay, the next one is sanding out of sequence. And this is actually a common mistake that um, not just first time guitar builders make, but really just first time woodworkers in general. So if you already have woodworking experience, then you know what I'm talking about here. And that's that you really. Uh, it takes a little experience to figure out how much time you need to spend on each grit to remove the previous grit's scratches. So if you were using 80 grit to shape things, because 80 grit is a very coarse grit, it's going to shape the wood very quickly, then you're going to need to at least use 120 next. First time woodworkers almost always uh, get to the finishing stage start applying finish and suddenly that glossy finish reveals to them some deep scratches 80 grit sometimes 120 but usually even an, a big deep 80 grit scratch that you just didn't see before suddenly you can see it okay the last thing I want to talk about is really a mindset kind of thing and it's what I like to call perfectionism procrastination which is you know, people who label themselves as perfectionists, um, who are almost using their perfectionism as a crutch. I believe that everyone has a finite mental bandwidth that they can commit to any given project. And it doesn't matter if, if you string that project out um, over a really long time span, there's still only a certain amount of mental energy that you can commit to a single project before you either abandon the project altogether or you just begin to get anxious and a little bit sloppy with your work. If you, you take it as a fact that you have a finite mental bandwidth and you know that if you apply it in certain areas that's taking away from how, how much you can apply in a different area, if that makes any sense, then it, it just makes sense to um, not 
be such a perfectionist in the beginning when you're just trying to get the wheels turning, get yourself moving, get yourself on the road to a finished guitar. Anyway, I hope this helps. I hope there was a lot of things in there, food for thought, that gives you something to think about when you're just getting started building your first guitar. And I wish you guys the best of luck in getting started on that project. It's going to be long. It's going to be um, it's going to have its trials, but I think you're going to find that's going to be extremely rewarding and fulfilling in the end. Thanks for watching.